Good morning, church. How you doing? All right. I am, uh, I am excited about today, this week. Um, it has been, it's been a really cool week for me in a lot of ways. Before we jump in the message, um, I want to invite you to Fortify. Fortify is our three-week kind of small group experience. Um, Fortify me, uh, means to strengthen. And so when we're talking about Fortify here at church, we're talking about strengthening our relationships with our Heavenly Father, our relationships with the church and one another, and then um, also strengthening our connections with the ministries here. And so if you're new to the church, I want to personally invite you to take part in Fortify. It starts tonight. It's uh, three weeks. It meets at 5.30 uh, to 7. We have dinner together. Child care is provided. Um, and it's an opportunity for me to get to know you, to get to spend some time with you. So I want you to, to consider this your personal invitation to come and to experience uh, Fortify with us tonight. It starts at 5.30. I would really love for you to be a part of that. Maybe you've been in the church for a while, um, but you, you haven't made any connections yet with some other folks. Uh, Fortify is a great place to do that. So I invite you, even if you've been around for a while, I want you to come and to be a part of that tonight. All right, we are in the last message of our Abundant Life series. And what we've been doing is we've been going through a list of character qualities um, that the Bible describes as the fruit of the Spirit. And what we mean by that is God promises that when we are in relationship with him, that he will give us his spirit. That actually the spirit of God will indwell, live within us, and empower us to live for Jesus or to live like Jesus. And Jesus says that if you remain in me and I in you, then you will bear much fruit. He uses the imagery of a, a vine and branches. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me, remain attached to Jesus, then you'll bear much fruit. And so the fruit that, um, that he's talking about. We have been working through a list in the book of Galatians, which is towards the end of your Bible there. In Galatians chapter 5, this list is given. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, this list is not an exhaustive list of the character qualities that God uh, grows in you as you're in relationship with him, as you're living your Christian life, but it's a good list for us to work off of, and it's a good list for us to think, boy, I would like for my life to be identified, to be marked by those things, more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, right? Wouldn't we like, love for our life to look more like that? And so um, today, today, we are on the fruit of self-control or the character character quality of self-control. Now, I thought a lot about trying to find somebody else to preach this message, all right? Because um, I obviously have some issues with self-control, but this is uh, what we want to learn today is that this self-control is not just about pushing away from dessert, but it has to do with a, a whole lot more than that. Um, and it's actually one of the things that is going to be very key for us to stay on track in our Christian walk. Without self-control, we fall victim to temptations um, uh, in our lives. And when I say temptation, uh, let, me, let me explain it this way. There are things in your life, um, in all of our lives, that would, that would entice us. Um, it might be because our desires are pointed in that direction, or our passions are pointed in that direction. Maybe there's a promise of some kind of pleasure or gain, or that others would see us as um, as uh, as higher than than we are now. That we might get some esteem out of it. Um, and there are those things that that are they seem enticing, they seem pleasurable. But what we know is that the outcome of those things is they end up hurting us and hurting our relationships with others, hurting our families. And so the Bible calls those things that are contrary to God's design, God's path for your life, calls those things sin. And so what we want to do is we want to watch out for those things because we know, and you've experienced in your own life, that when you give in to those things, when you, when you say yes to those temptations, that even though there might be pleasure in the moment, that there are consequences that come along with that, that it ends up hurting you and hurting your family, hurting your children. Um, and so what we are trying to learn through this whole experience of abundant life is that our, the abundance of our life is not in the amount of stuff that we have, but it's how we have this, uh, this growth in our character that helps us to get through the circumstances of life. All of us have ups and downs that we experience in our lives, but how do we get through those? 
Some people seem to have real strength. They don't lose their joy and their peace as they go through a financial crisis or a crisis of health. Other people, it throws their whole life off track. And so what we're trying to, we're trying to see is that as God grows these character qualities in us, they are the things that control the quality of our life, not just the circumstances. We're not blown about by every, you know, by every wind of our circumstances that knock us off track, that, that ruin our families, but our character quality that God is growing in us determines the quality of our life. And so self-control is the ability to, um, to push back or to control our passions and our desires. So the ability to, to hold down or to control our passions and our desires. Now, it, you know that that is a hard thing to do, right? That there are some passions and desires and temptations in your life that you feel completely weak to. You feel like, well, I'm just, I, I fail over and over and over again in that way. And I wish, I wish I had some power over those things. And maybe you've gotten to the point where, you failed so many times and you're just trusting in the forgiveness of Jesus and you're just kind of going, well, I guess it's not that bad. And I know a whole lot of other people who do the same thing, right? And, and even if they don't admit it, they, and so we become accustomed to failing to these things to where n now it's not even so much of a fight. It's just kind of we've given in to it. I want to give you um, a picture to help us to think about uh, the sin problem of these temptations. If you go all the way back to the, um, the beginning of the Bible, um, Adam and Eve, the first uh, people that God created, they had um, two sons. Their names are Cain and Abel. And Cain becomes very jealous and bitter towards his brother. So jealous and bitter towards his brother, it, eventually he will kill him. And so God comes to him as Cain is so angry, and he says this to him. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? And he says this. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if, you do, uh, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, the right, the right thing for us to be picturing here is that we hear something outside of our door, right? Maybe it's night, right? We hear something outside and we go to, go to check on it. We have raccoons around our house, right? Hear them out there messing around in the trash all the time, right? And so I go out there and I peek out and maybe I see a raccoon. Maybe that's how you think about your temptations or the sin problems. So you, you kind of have that kind of like, is that raccoon in the garbage? I'm going to have to clean that up. But here, this image is much more than that. What we should be thinking about is that we would, we would hear that noise outside and we would open that door and this is what we would see. Right here. <laughs> Peek open and a giant beast is ready to push right through that door and eat your face off. All right? That's... That's the way we should think about it. But that's not the way we always think about it. In fact, we've grown so accustomed to, to failing to these things and, and cozying up to them that, that really it looks more like this. This is kind of how we think about it. our temptations and, our, and we, we've just sort of given over to them and that's just kind of how it is and we cozy right up to them like they're not really dangerous, like they can't really hurt us even though we've experienced it already in the past but we've just gotten used to it. We say, well, God forgives. Jesus forgives. But how, how many times have you experienced the consequences of these things? How many families have been broken? How many lives have been destroyed? And as we, as we cuddle up to these, these wrong ways, these sinful ways, we get more and more used to them. And one day... That line's going to reach right up and, because it's capable the whole time, right? What we need, what we need is some control over these circumstances. Now, we've already said, we don't feel like we're in control, right? When these temptations come and it's just us and nobody else will know and, and you know, our, our parents aren't there and our spouse isn't there and nobody will catch us and we can do whatever we want to in that moment and we feel like nobody will, nobody will know about it, what do we do? We give on in, right? You know those, that concern that somebody would catch us? You know, that's a form of control on our lives, Right? 
It's not a self-control. It's a somebody else's control. You're worried about if somebody catches you, then you'll get in trouble or this would hurt your marriage. And let me tell you something. That's not all bad. That fear is not all bad, all right? It's actually, and you may be thinking, self-control, I need to be in control. I need to have the kind of will, the kind of strength that is able to say no in the face of any desire, any temptation. God's gonna give me the strength to do that. I'm gonna be able to do it. And you've thought that before and you've gone right back into those places that are dangerous and what's happened? You failed, right? You ended up using again. You ended up back in that relationship that was destructive and dangerous for your life. You ended up caught back up in pornography. Whatever it was, you thought, I'm gonna gonna white knuckle my way through this with God's power and God's strength. I'm gonna be able to do it. And what happened? You failed. You failed you. So what I wanna talk about this morning is um, one of the things that God uh, can help us to do in our lives to set up some controls in our lives so that we are not doing this. See, what we need is we need something between us and and these temptations. In, um, In Proverbs chapter 25, it says this, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a person who lacks self-control. When we don't have control of our lives, we don't have control over these temptations, right? We're like a city that is vulnerable. So what we need to do is we need some walls between us and these temptations. We need, we need to set up some boundaries, all right? And so, um, so that's what we're going to talk through in the next few moments, some boundaries. We need to, let's, let's go back to that last picture, all right? Because... Um, we all feel weak at times. We all feel like we can't, we can't protect ourselves from the temptation. We're going to give into it. And so what we need is we need some boundary between us. And we think, well, you, you're talking about setting up some controls, some rules. Listen, this is part of self-control, all right? It's not just white-knuckling your way through. You are taking charge of your life. You're going to set up some boundaries, some walls in your life to keep you from the temptation so that even when you are weak, And the temptation is there. There There's something protecting you. There's something in between you and that so that you don't fall to it, so that your family is not destroyed by it over and over again. And so let's talk through some ways that we can can get some help. Um, Let's talk about some some walls that we can build up. First of all, um, one of the walls that we need to to have in our life is a protective wall of good people around us, okay? Now, There are people in your life and there are people in your past that you know when you are with them, when you spend time with them, things do not go well. Either they uh, they continually drive you nuts, you want to hurt them, or they're your using buddies or whatever it is, but you, you know that these people are not good for you, not good for your life. And so what do you need to do? You need to put a wall between you and them. Well, how do you do that? Well, there's, there's just common sense stuff. All right, first of all, you just, you just cut them off, right? You remove them from your Facebook. You remove them from your Instagram. You take them out of your phone. You block their number. And you may, you may think right now, oh, that's not self-control. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I ought to be able to see them on Facebook and not want to go back and hang out with them or not want to text them. And, no, all right, we're putting up some walls here for when you feel weak, right? This is part of self-control. You're the one who's going to take them out of your Facebook. You're the one who's going to block them from your phone, all right? This is God's going to empower you to set up the controls in your life so that you do not fall to these things. So you realize it is a beast about to devour you, and you're going to put up some boundaries in your life. And God's going to help you to do that. It's going to give you the wisdom to do that. It's going to give you the self-control to do that. And you need to surround yourself with good and positive people. People who are pursuing the same things in life that you are. People who are chasing after Jesus. People who are trying to uh, raise their kids in the same way as you are. People are trying to live their, their, out in their marriages the same way as you are. You need to be around those people. Those need to be your support group. Those need to be the kind of people that if they see you going off track, they go, brother, sister, I love you come on where you know that's you know that's dangerous you know that hurts you over there and the kind of people that you when you're around you're not going to do things that they would think are not right because you would be embarrassed embarrassment is not bad right to keep you on the right track fear is not bad to keep you on the right I I know you want to think I just want to do it because I love Jesus absolutely 
<laughs> Absolutely, we wanna do it because we love Jesus. But when we're weak, when we're, when we're weak, when we're a little child, right? God's gonna give us the wisdom to set up these walls in between. He's gonna use other people in our life to put us on the right track, to keep us from danger. And so you need to find yourself in relationships like that. The church is the place to do that. And so you might come in here and maybe you haven't developed any other relationships with, with other people here. Take the opportunity to do that. Um, we have fall group on Wednesday night where you can come and you can sit around table with other folks. Tonight it fortifies an opportunity to come and to meet some other people. Um, but you need, to, you need to do that. Have ongoing, regular relationship with other Christians so that you have a, so you have a support group of people who are protecting your life, watching out for you, right? Not the people who, who you know where you go when you're with them. You know where your mind goes, you know where your attitude goes, and you may be thinking, well, I'm, I need to witness to that person, right? I need to be a good example to that person. There are lots of other people that you can be a good example for, and there are lots of other people that can be a good example for them. If they're the one that constantly takes you to that bad place, if they're your using buddy, if they're the person that, that takes you to that bad headspace, all right, separate. Let's have a wall there to protect you. The other thing is we can actually set up some, some other rules in our lives. Now, we're, we're grace people. We love grace, but we can actually use rules to protect ourselves, right? We can set up some, some rules and some boundaries far enough back away from the danger so that we don't end up hurting ourselves. So, so some common sense rules, thinking about relationships with, with the opposite sex, right? Um, I am just so tired, exhausted, broken, Hearing about marriages failed to infidelity. They just so tiresome. So many. And you know, there's there's a lot of things that a marriage can come back from. A lot of, you know, financial trouble or health trouble or, you know, how we raise the kids or all kinds of disagreements that a marriage can come back from. And a marriage can overcome infidelity. With, with Jesus, all things are possible. But it is hard. It is so hard. It is such a break of trust. When you think about that, when you think about infidelity, you need to be thinking about that lion at your door. You don't need to give one little crack for that thing to pounce in and destroy your family. And so what can you do? You can set up some rules. It may sound old-fashioned or whatever, but don't, don't go to lunch. Don't go to dinner with somebody that's not your spouse, that's the opposite sex, alone. Don't do it. Yeah, that's old-fashioned. Yeah. It's just lunch. It's just lunch. How, do these things all start with, hey, coworker? I know we just met. But you want to go to the hotel after work? And no, no. That's not how it goes. Right? It starts with lunch. And then do not complain. This is a rule. Do not complain about your spouse to another woman, another man. Don't do it. Don't do it. You start confiding in one another. Oh, see, he just doesn't treat you like I can treat you. Come on. Don't do it. See, we, what we do is we set up these rules far enough away from the edge of the cliff, from death, destruction, that we don't get there. And you're thinking, that's me. Don't even go to lunch. Well, listen. Bit by bit, closer and closer, edging over to the end where there's death and destruction. So if we put the rules back here, you're thinking, we're not rule people. We're grace people. If you're not powerful enough... This is part of God growing your character, giving you self-control to set up the boundaries, to set up the walls, all right, so that you don't end up in the place that destroys your family. Other walls that you could put up. Um, another really dangerous thing today is the impact of pornography in our culture. Um, Everyone, uh, you know, every one of our kids over about six years old has almost open access to every kind of imagery, the, and, and not, not just like regular, like every 
possible corruption of sexuality out there is totally accessible with just a few clicks. Um, walking around with it in their pocket. And I said kids, but that's true of all of you as well. But I wanted to start with children. Because if you have a child, you want to protect them from that. Because it does real damage. It does real lasting damage. Some of you in here could testify to that. Some of you have grown up in the internet age and you could say, yeah, it has done real damage to the way my mind works, to the way that I think about my spouse, to the way that I think about sexuality. It has done real damage to me. It does. There's research that shows that, you know, if you come through and uh, in, in your adolescence consuming a lot of that, all that imagery and it actually changes the pathways of your brain, right? It's just, it's amazing. And, and so it does real, real damage. And so you want to protect your kids from from that. You don't want them, you don't want them exposed to that. It's going to uh, mar them and, and give them a jaded view of, of life and hurt their, their ability to have real satisfying relationships throughout their life. You don't want, you don't want that to happen. And so you want to set up walls in their lives. And so maybe you've heard about things like, you know, safe browsing softwares, right? There's all kinds of them out there. You can get them on phones and you can get them on your computers and your tablets and everything else. All right. But let me tell you something. Your kids are still smarter than that, all right? So you need to be checking with them, right? You need to be following up on that, right? And so you set up rules, you set up boundaries, and don't, don't abdicate, don't give that up to somebody else. Don't just say, well, everybody lets their kids do with their phones and their computers and their TV like this, and that's just the way of the world. No, 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 no. Be weird. Be weird about it, all right? I... I It's worth being weird about. It really is. And you may think, well, they're just going to act like they hate me. Listen, all teenagers act like they hate their parents, right? So we'll just try the best way we can to get through this, all right, while protecting you, while doing what's really best for you, right? And, you know, I'll just live with you hating me for a while, okay? I'm a big boy. I can take it. Now, all that exists for kids, it all exists for adults too. And there are marriages, men and women alike, that are destroyed by this, that are, their mind is corrupted, their sense of what is okay and their sense of what is, is um, right and natural in their relationship is, is blown up by this. And... Um, so you, as adults, you can do the same thing. You can set up these walls and these boundaries. So that safe browsing software, that works on adult computers too, all right? And you give your wife, your husband, your password. you transparent about all of that. Walls that we can put in our lives. The other thing that we can do is we can set up some positive routines, to protect ourselves. Um, now, I am not a very disciplined person, all right? I am kind of, you know, I like whatever's going on, I like to jump into that and do that, and whatever food's on the table, let's eat all that food, and, you know, whatever ice cream's there, let's eat all that ice cream, and, and whatever fun's to be had, let's have all that fun, you know, just let's go, 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 go. Uh, and so, um, so I have, to, I have to play some tricks on myself because I know I'm not a disciplined person, but I am a, a routine person, a habitual person. That's true for just about everybody. We all fall into habits. Some of them are good habits and some of them are bad habits, right? We're all habitual though. I mean, you get up, you don't think about how you do your morning routine. I mean, right now, could you tell me what order you brush your teeth and put onto your deodorant? But in the morning, it all happens the same way every time, right? It's just you're, you're habitual. So how do, we, how do we put in some routines in our lives that are helpful that will build some walls in our lives to keep us from temptation, some habits? Um, there's the routine and the habit of reading our Bible, daily communing with God through prayer, the habit, the routine of being in church, being in small group, all right, always in those routines. We've just decided beforehand that's part of our lives. Those routines keep us away from other things that will harm us, and they build up uh, positive growth in our life through being in the Word and through being uh, communing with God. If you go back into the Old Testament, um, 
Uh, there's a really cool story um, of, it's called uh, Daniel in the Lion's Den. Everybody heard of the story of Daniel in the Lion's Den? It's one that even, even if you haven't been around church a lot, maybe you've heard of that story. And so if you go back into the, the history of the, the Jewish people, um, God had uh, just seen them through their ups and downs and sometimes they would turn from God and God would, would send in another nation to judge them and to help them to, to see that they need to turn back to him. And one of these times, uh, a, a, a foreign nation comes in and, and conquers Israel and they begin to take um, they take some of the best and the brightest of Israel's uh, young men and women with them back to be slaves. And they're going to raise them up to be, um, to be like liaisons between them and back to Israel or other countries. And so they actually treat them pretty well as these slaves. And, and one of those guys' name is Daniel. And Daniel, um, Daniel does very well um, as he's in this system. He actually, throughout the, throughout the years, he, um, he stays faithful to God every step of the way. He stays on, uh, uh, true to God's commands and true to what God uh, has designed for the way for him to live. And he stays true to that all the way through, but he still does very well in this foreign culture. Um, he actually gets raised up to power, and, um, and other people become jealous of it. One of Daniel's routines, his daily routines, was to go up into his house, all right, on the second floor, and he would open up the shutters of his house, and he would get down on his knees and bow down towards, facing towards Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the place where the temple of God was, and so he's, he's far away from home, but his trust and his faith is still in the one true and living God. And so every day, he goes up, and he opens that room, the windows of that room, and he bows down, and he prays to God, puts his faith and his trust in God over and over again. He does it three times a day, every day, goes, leaves whatever he's doing, goes up into that room, opens the windows and prays. Well, some of the men who were jealous of Daniel go to the king and they're, they're trying to devise a way to take Daniel out and they, they get the, the king to pass a law that you can't bow down to anyone else or anything else other than the king himself. You sh everyone should show complete allegiance to the king. If they bow down to any, anyone else, that they'll be killed. And the way that they were going to execute them was to throw them into the lion's den. And so the decree goes out, but Daniel doesn't change his behavior. Daniel continues his routine. He goes up into his house. He opens the door and he kneels down and he prays. Three times a day, just like he always did. He had already decided beforehand, long before the decree came, that his trust was going to be in God. That his routine was going to be to daily trust in his heavenly Father. For all of his needs, for everything. It didn't matter what, how the culture was shifting or what's happening around our lives. He'd already made the decision. And so there he was, wide open for the whole world to see. And so they go back and they say, King Daniel, he's bowing down, he's praying to this foreign God. And so they bring him in. And true to the law, they bring him in and they throw him into this lion's den, pit with lions in there, hungry lions. It's a death sentence. They're going to eat him. This is the way of his execution. They roll a stone. They're rolling the stone over that thing, uh, over the hole of that, that den. The king says, I hope your God can save you, Daniel. They roll that stone over. And the next morning, when they come back, they open it up, look down, and Daniel's looking up. Hey. King says, your God protected you, saved you. He said, my God, shut the mouth of the lions. These temptations are all around you. They are roaring lions that would devour you. They are crouching at your door. They desire to have you. But you must master them. God has given you, through the power of his Holy Spirit, the strength to say no, the strength to set up boundaries in your life. He himself, he himself, through his power, can shut the mouths of the lions. If we go to... Um, 
Go over in the New Testament book of uh, Titus. It says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. We do not try and follow the rules. We're not trying to get away from temptation just so we can be rule followers, just so we can do it like this. No, God himself has loved us through his son, Jesus Christ, even though we were fallen, even though, he says, even though we were wicked in our ways, and weren't we? He said, even though his grace has come to us, through Jesus' work on the cross and the power of the resurrection, his power has flowed down to us that we might be saved. And in that joy of that salvation, we go, yes, I want to live a life that glorifies God, that protects my family, that protects my children, that protects my witness so that I can stand here and I can proclaim the glory and the work of Jesus Christ and not have people go, yeah, I know about that. Yeah, I know about that. You know what they do, right? But God will help us through his power to shut the mouth of these temptations, to set up these walls, to, to self-control our lives so that we are protected from those that would destroy us from the habits, from the sins, from the temptations that would destroy our families and destroy our witness. He himself has made it possible through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He can empower you to have that control in your life. Father, thank you so much. God, that even though we are weak, that you are strong. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom, but also power to set up these, these rules, these boundaries in our lives, God. Not so that we would be right and good. But God, we want to be those things. But God, we want to, in our loving relationship with you, God, we want to demonstrate our faith in you. That we believe that what you did for us was true and full and can change our lives. God, we want to daily trust our lives to you. Help us, Father. Help us, Father. Help us to see the places where we need to wisely set up boundaries in our lives. Help us to be self-controlled. Protect our families. Protect our children. Protect your glorious witness here in this church and in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today. We hope you were ministered to by the message. To keep up with all things that God's doing through the Fort Church, visit our website, fortchurch.org. Follow our social media outlets such as Facebook and Instagram. You can also support this ministry by giving online at fortchurch.org.